Hey everyone, so today we are going to be looking at the uh, Bolshevik Revolution, right? The rise of the Reds, the rise of the Communists, and Lenin, and Stalin, uh, and all of them. Uh, we're going to be focusing on uh, the sort of tail end of World War I, uh, how the Bolshevik Revolution uh, began, what the, were the reasons for it. Uh, we're going to get into some ideological conversations of capitalism versus Marxism, uh, and eventually Leninism. Uh, and why this was such a large and monumental uh, shift in history, uh, not just for uh, Eastern European slash sort of Asian Russian history, because the Russian Empire was so large, but also for world history, uh, because communism ended up being, you know, such a large world event uh, and influenced so many nations around the world that we had an entire Cold War, right, because of this, um, entering into the uh, two superpower dynamic between the United States and the Soviet Union. So uh, it is definitely something to uh, study and talk about and analyze, and it is a very interesting part of history. Uh, so let's just get into it. Uh, for you know the beginning tail end of the uh, Russian Revolution, uh, we have to understand how some of the sort of decline of the Russian Tsar you know, regime um, happen. So the Russian czars, right, the totalitarian leaders, the uh, absolute monarchs, right, and we've studied them in the past with Catherine the Great, right, Peter the Great, all of these kind of strong monarchs. Uh, towards the tail end of the late 1800s and especially the early 1900s, uh, the czars started to see that their power was slowly but surely loosening a bit. Uh, four main reasons for this. Number one, um, the serfs were emancipated uh, in the late 1800s, um, and they were st still earning too few privileges. And so, yes, they were, quote unquote, emancipated. They were not tied to the land anymore, but uh, they still really could not, you know, grow their wealth or, um, you know, call a lot of land or resources their own. So they wanted more reform. Uh, many ethnic minorities throughout the empire, because an empire is a very diverse collection of different types of nationalities, um, they were resenting what was called Russification. Um, so that's the process by which uh, the powers at be, right, the state in control, is trying to forcibly assimilate everybody under its uh, umbrella, meaning everyone should uh, speak Russian, talk Russian, culturally be Russian, right? So try to have everyone kind of under that same uh, national mindset. Uh, the working class were resenting that the government itself and the Russian uh, Tsarist regime was uh, stifling their unionization efforts. And so the workers were not getting paid enough. Uh, industrialization was truly, you know, kind of starting. And so the Russian Empire was dealing with a lot of the same issues that other nations had been with industrialization and some of the pitfalls of that as well. And lastly, the intelligentsia um, were proliferating all of these radical ideas throughout the universities. Um, radical ideas stemming from Germany and France, uh, ideas of revolution, of Marxist ideals, um, of having egalitarian societies and breaking down the machine of capitalism and all of these kind of other, uh, you know, ideas that were seen as uh, very dangerous, right, to a monarchy. And so we slowly start to get the consolidation of some type of Russian constitution, right? Um, and so the czar, um, they understand that, you know, they cannot just keep going uh, as, you know, they had been for, you know, for the last couple hundred years. Uh, they needed to slowly start bringing in reform and slowly start bringing in change. The only question was, within the Russian Empire, at, you know, what level were they going to institute change and how fast? Because Russian history is steeped in a lot of um, uprisings and revolutions. The peasants, right, every single year or a few times a year would kind of, you know, rally up against the local masters or the landowners or states. Uh, and so Russian history was pretty brutal and violent. And so from a very kind of top-down administrating kind of uh, czar uh, you know, perspective, I might imagine that if they wanted to, let's say, uh, start, you know, re releasing the valve, so to speak, 
um, and start implementing more reforms, they were cautious that the valve would not get out of hand and then the floodgates would just open, right? And revolution and everything would spread out. So it was a very kind of interesting dynamic there. But we had some early attempts at a constitution starting in 1906 um, where some paperwork was drawn up to at least have the conversation started for the emperor, right, the czar, to have his power limited by a parliament. And so the czar was finally agreeing to um, to create what was called the Duma, or essentially their like democratic parliament and assembly. Um, and so, you know, slowly but surely power was, you know, started to have the conversation of, you know, delineating responsibilities. Uh, a lot of national sentiment around the empire um, started to change. So as nationalistic points of view started to rise and, you know, the whole, uh, not just Russification under the ethnic Russians, but let's say anyone else under the Russian umbrella, whether they were Cossacks, um, they were, uh, let's say, Poles or Ukrainians or whoever else, um, they started to really kind of nationalize um, amongst their own cultural identities, uh, leading to, unfortunately, a lot of pogroms, which were violent massacres and uh, hate crimes towards ethnic Jews. Um, and so... Uh, this you know portion of Russian history is going to be you know very uh, complex, intersectional, having a lot of different uh, moving parts, and so I tried to piece all of this together in a uh, you know straight timeline, so for us to kind of get an idea of what was going on for the revolution. Uh, and here's the early Duma that we were talking about, right? That democratic assembly, the parliament um, that they were assembling, um, and then over here in the back of the uh, room, we can see the portrait of Tsar Nicholas II. So we have slow, you know, uh, revolution ideas and revolution uh, sort of events, right, transpire. The, the first big one was called the Putilov Strike or nicknamed Bloody Sunday or Red Sunday. And so here, we have a bunch of, you know, uh, peaceful protesters. They're getting fed up with the status quo and they want that valve, right, that the czar needs to keep bringing forth more reforms. They want it to happen a little faster. So they want more reforms. They want the czar to hear their pleas because the czar is the head of the state. He is the final end all be all, you know, solution, right? Power rests with him. So they're going and marching towards the Winter Palace in a peaceful protest uh, led by Father Georgi Gapan. And so they want to, you know, ha uh, present a petition to him, right? What kind of reforms they would like. Uh, and so it was met with brutal resistance. Uh, you know, you know, the czar was not having any of this. And especially after we had all of these, you know, uh, historical events with French Revolution and all of these other ones, the absolute monarchs were very wary of, uh, you know, protesters marching towards the palace. And so uh, the, you know, Bloody Sunday um, ended up having the royal guard, um, you know, shooting into uh, the protesters, right? Uh, hence calling it Bloody Sunday. And so news of this uh, massacre, right? Um, spread and so over 400,000 workers in Russia's Poland began to strike over this kind of injustice. So just think of it over you know a few different mishaps and let's say a bloody Sunday event, right? Uh, suddenly you have over 400,000 workers striking, right? In one part of the empire, these are large numbers, and so hopefully we can put all of this into a little bit of context as far as let's say the. Uh, balance between, you know, trying to open up democratic ideals and ruling a nation, right, as czar. And so the state Duma, the democratic parliamentary system that they're attempting to establish, um, you know, was convening here and there, but it was seen as more of a puppet democracy. So essentially, Nicholas II said, oh, fine, we'll have a Duma, we'll have a parliamentary kind of uh, system in place, but it did not really have any power. So all power rested with him um, from 1906 to 1917. They only met four times, right? It was not too effective. And so once people found out what the true uh, nature of the Duma was, that is not actually a parliament that will bring forth change and reforms, but it's just his puppet government, um, they were, you know, up in arms. 
uh, calling for strikes and wanting uh, to, uh, you know, have their voices heard. Um, following a lot of these strikes in 1905, the Tsar ordered the military to execute over 14,000 revolutionaries and imprison around 75,000 individuals and sympathizers as well. And so, as you can see here, it's a constant tug and pull between revolutionaries and new ideas. The Tsar still trying to hold on to power. And so these are big numbers, right? Large groups of people that we're talking about, huge movements. And so at this point in time, it was not enough for an overthrow of the government yet. But as we're going to see, as these kind of waves and motions are going about back and forth, eventually all of this, you know, pent up frustration and sentiment of the Russian people is going to be too much for the czar to handle. And so, you know, that bloody, that bloody Sunday scene, right? with Fargo uh, uh, Georgi. So he was leading, right, the uh, peaceful protesters, right? And then the Imperial uh, Royal Guard was, you know, mowing them down. And so throughout Russia, this was just seen as a catastrophe, right? A brutal oppression and a further oppression of the serfs. And so the people themselves are starting to become privy and wise against these absolute monarchs. Here's a primary source video. Um, of the uh, Imperial Guard on, on the bottom hand side, right, um, all kind of standing with their rifles and waiting um, to open fire onto the um, incoming crowd. So definitely, um, you know, not the perfect PR moment for Tsar Nicholas II. Um, and so many, you know, uh, so many magazine covers, right, and paintings started to get proliferated and cartoon artists um, of you know, the violent massacre and shooting into these peaceful Russians. And so the people themselves are having an absolute field day against Tsar Nicholas II and what is seen as the oppressor, right? And so who was Tsar Nicholas II? He was the last emperor of Russia, the last czar, part of the Ro uh, Romanov dynasty. Uh, and so the Romanovs had been in power for centuries. And so he is going to be the last one. And World War I, slash the Bolshevik Revolution is going to be the, the last straw, right? The, um, it's going to be the last, you know, sort of tilting moment for the Russian Empire. And so, you know, many factors led to his de uh, decline for Tsar Nicholas II. We're going to be focusing on some of the main beats throughout this lecture, but there were so many. Uh, you know, the, the anti-Semitic pogroms throughout the empire and uh, the killing and massacring of Jews. Uh, we have Bloody Sunday that we just talked about, right? So kind of spread throughout the newspapers. Um, violent suppressions by the czar himself. Uh, you know, execution of political opponents. You know, that's what the czar does. Um, and his perceived responsibility for the failure in the Russo-Japanese War. And so the Russo-Japanese War... Uh, as we talked about last time, was, um, you know, this major conflict between the Japanese rising imperial power uh, and the Russian Empire, right, in the east, um, near Manchuria, um, in northeastern uh, China. And so, you know, this was the first time that an Asian power actually defeated a European power. And it was seen throughout Russia, you know, as, well, you know, the great Tsar Nicholas II, you know, he led us to defeat, right? And he didn't go back and, you know, teach them a lesson or whatever. And so, you know, the czar's power or any person's power who is in such an authoritative position, it is typically a bit balance and mix between having real legitimate, you know, power and authority and influence over people and the military and everything else. And the other side of it, on the other side of the coin, is your perceived power, right? Uh, the symbolic gesture and power that you can have and so all of these kind of issues are slowly going to erode his act um, his um his perceived power in the public eye and eventually as his perceived power in the public eye is going to decline also his actual legitimate power is going to start declining um, his influence with the troops and um, etc um, and so we start having and seeing a bunch of different issues under his reign some agrarian or agricultural troubles are that the serfs wanted further reform from the government. They wanted more social changes, just like the rest of Europe was having at the time. Um, you know, some fellow historians write that at the beginning of the 20th century, agriculture constituted the single largest sector of the Russian economy, producing approximately one half of the national income. 
and employing two thirds of Russia's population. So the majority of Russia were still serfs, they were still toiling the land. And so the fact that in Bloody Sunday, we had these representatives of, let's say, the collective of serfs trying to go to the czar and ask for reforms, right, in a peaceful petition. Um, and the fact that it was met with brutal resistance has essentially angered the majority of the Russian population, right? So that's not uh, something that played out too well. Um, and, you know, as we're kind of getting closer towards World War One and the end of World War One. Uh, mismanagement from the government right, was leading towards inflation and later on famines. And so here we have Tsar Nicholas II, um, almost identical twins with uh, King George V, actually, of uh, England at that time. Uh, the father of Queen Elizabeth, right, currently, who's sitting on the throne of England, the constitutional monarch. Uh, and so they were, they were cousins, but they literally looked so similar. But here he is, right? Um, Tsar Nicholas II in his royal regalia on the right-hand side in his naval officer uniform. Um, so, you know, publicly, uh, you know, and with public perception, right, definitely trying to embody the look and the feel of a um, true powerful monarch. But the issues were not stopping, right? Um, you know, agrarian workers were continuing to be discontented. Um, the serfs wanted a fair share of the land profits and they wanted reforms. They wanted to stop paying these heavy burdens to the uh, state. They wanted something closer towards, let's say, a democratic European model where you could have a middle class start to grow and thrive. They could have their own rights, their property um, and start building you know, wealth from this, from, uh, for themselves. They didn't want most of their you know, money and their wealth going to the landlords and to the state, the czar. Um, we also have the byproduct effect of industrialization. Uh, you and I have been talking about from our previous lectures about the rise of industrialization within Europe and Japan and China and how some of those issues were uh, forming. Uh, and so, you know, some of the byproducts of industrialization are, yes, you have factory work and you have all this mechanization, but wage labor is cheap. Um, and, you know, the amount of people that you have to employ is also becoming, um, you know, let's say non-existent, right? Instead of hiring 200 people for, you know, old school type of work, you can now maybe hire a fraction of that because the machines are doing more. But people are still starting to flood the cities because industrialization um, and work is starting to flow. Um, and so if you have the option of toiling the land, or let's say going to St. Petersburg or Moscow or all these big cities where these new cool industrial factories are, you know, more people wanted to kind of, you know, go towards these larger cities. Uh, and so we start to see overcrowding. We start to see bad sanitation conditions in these large cities. So some folks in the big cities are now unhappy. As true industrialization, um, you know, throughout the world, we start seeing 10 to 12 hour work days, right, that are not uncommon because the government has not caught up with, let's say, work laws because industrialization is such a new phenomenon. Costs of living were rising. Um, World War One was exacerbating all of these issues on top of that. And so people were, you know, just like any other nation feeling this transitional period of industrialization. But it still falls onto the shoulders of Tsar Nicholas II because he is, you know, the final governmental force, right? He is the absolute monarch. And so the fact that he was kind of being a bit nonchalant about many of these issues and not being very, very hands on was an absolute mistake and would prove to be a deadly error on his part. And so I want to kind of get into this is not part of the reading, but this is just a kind of a side note, uh, because in history and historians always keep saying Tsar Nicholas II was not a good ruler. He was uh, not hands on. He was not active enough right, to save his empire, because in previous lectures, we found that whenever, uh, you know, let's say we had peasant revolts under Catherine the Great, for example, you know, she would brutally suppress these, you know, rebellions, right, with crushing force, right? So she would exert her uh, authority over the nation um, and essentially tell people like, you know, or show people symbolically, like there is no weakness in the czar, you know, sort of state. Um, but Tsar Nicholas II was a bit different and we'll get into how. First of all, he was, you know, traditionally a kind and shy personality type. 
he was not this let's say larger than life outgoing figure like peter the great was right traveling europe and trying to find all of this new technology and drag russia by their beard into modernization you know he was a kind and shy individual he's more introverted right he did not like being in the spotlight too much um and so he kind of resented a lot of his uh imperial duties um and in a normal let's say calm stable peaceful reign that could probably fly that could probably be okay however um during this major crisis that russia found itself in getting dragged into world war one having all these issues having revolutionaries kind of you know filter throughout the um uh, the land and the cities uh it needed a really strong czar to like you know take things back under control but that was just not his personality type and also there was a another big one um that preoccupied a lot of his time his uh his only son he had he had his uh a str- long you know str- uh, line of uh daughters but his only son his male heir the tsarevich uh he was born with hemophilia that's a disease where if you accidentally cut yourself somewhere it just consistently bleeds and flows um and at that point in time there was no way to stop hemophilia or to treat it and so if let's say your son or daughter would cut themselves and they could potentially just bleed out to death and so he and his wife alexandra were always on edge they were always very very careful not to have um alexey kind of go off and run about and do whatever he needs to do but he's a kid you know he's, he wants to play he wants to kind of run around and so sometimes he'll scrape his knee as he's playing but because he has hemophilia his knee is not going to heal so the blood just keeps flowing more and more um and so with no solution in sight and as uh, Alexei actually um had a very bad case of internal hemorrhaging um at one point in time they turned towards this famous uh Russian witch doctor known as Rasputin um and so in historical context and in some lore um you know during that point in time when Alexei had the internal hemorrhaging somehow and historians still debate this today like how in the heck this man ended up doing it or maybe he just got super lucky whatever the reason was but alexey was kind of having internal hemorrhaging uh rasputin comes to his bed famously right because this is the last ditch effort all of the royal doctors cannot fix the boy um and so he comes and kind of you know mutters some chants and gets into his you know his rhythm and kind of says a few things or whatever he does but in the next day or two the boy miraculously made a, you know a very good recovery and so that was enough for tsar nicholas ii and um alexandra to essentially say that oh he's the real deal he's the only person that can fix our family uh and fix uh you know um alexey's uh disease and so you know m- rumors started to spread because as the this witch doctor rasputin started to you know have more influence and clout within the royal palace um you know rumors started to spread that oh, you know maybe this is a potential affair with alexandra um you know maybe he is not a true uh, orthodox christian and worships god maybe he is the antichrist uh maybe the tsar is not uh having enough power or control over his own household um and his wife is fornicating away right all of these rumors start to spread even within the royal family itself the various other dukes um part of the royal family and lineage were starting to get um you know upset and eventually um some of the royal family members uh actually coerced Rasputin into their palace and they ended up shooting him um to death one bullet in the forehead as well uh, i'm not going to show that gruesome of a scene here but uh yes so definitely Rasputin was first welcomed by the family and then all of the rumor and gossip sort of turned it away um but on the left hand side we have Tsar Nicholas II and Alexei right his heir with the hemophilia condition and on the right hand side we have Rasputin uh as you can tell he looks like a bit of a uh interesting character right a little bit of a maybe witch doctor esque vibes and so if you saw him roaming throughout the palace um you know it definitely wasn't uh let's say the the best sight um especially because Russia was trying to modernize itself um and let's say have something closer to you know what 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 the czar is wearing now right western clothing um western haircut very you know prim and proper uh, and then Rasputin comes in a very kind of old school traditional russian viking way with his big burly beard and you know kind of disheveled look um and so uh he kind of was out of fit right at the royal palace for sure 
Um, but uh, let's get back onto the world stage. So World War One continues. And so Russia is dragged into World War One because of all of those alliances. Uh, and we have, you know, national unity initially at the beginning of the war, right? Russia, just like every other war that it's been in. Um, the Tsar, you know, rallies together the troops um, under God, Orthodox Christianity, we will be victorious, right? And so, you know, folks are gathering together for a war and battle cry. Um, however, um, this war effort, because it's on such a large uh, scale, it really starts to deplete um, the Russian forces and the Russian food. Um, so what ends up happening traditionally is that, you know, uh, Russia will go into these short term wars, um, you know, over a couple of years, um, and then either would be a victor or a loser, and they can make, you know, some type of treaty. Now they are entering into a very long and protracted war with heavy amounts of casualties. And so the Russian system of, you know, the military, the government and the um, uh, you know, the agricultural sector, right? All of it is being, uh, you know, tested and strained to the absolute limit. Um, and so the fact that they were at war for such a long period of time, their food supply started to get a bit short. Um, and so, you know, by the middle of World War One, we start to see more food shortages, the, um, the casualty rate on the front lines are stacking up. And so there's no sense of, oh, well, Russia's on the winning side of this, right? The sense is just, we're barely making any advancement on the Eastern Front, and we're just losing hundreds of thousands of men, you know, what, what are we doing this for? Um, inf uh, inflation is rising within uh, the nation as well. Uh, strikes at the factories were increasing because uh, pay was traditionally low right because of the whole industrialization effort right you want to keep payments low and you want to keep the factory workers just working for a wage um, however if your pay is really low and you have inflation at the same time that like five bucks you're making an hour is worth nothing in a month or two right so you want to get paid more and so it was a huge back and forth um, peasants wanting more land reforms, factory uh, workers starting to, you know, really, uh, you know, ask themselves like, well, you know, we want reforms and Tsar Nicholas II is not adhering to any of our demands, not even hearing us out. Um, and so things got so bad that, you know, the front line troops started to lose morale. And so Tsar Nicholas II eventually uh, went over to the front lines uh, to kind of bolster the morale. And Alexandra was left back into the uh, back in the capital um, with Rasputin and her son. So further kind of leading towards rumors that, oh, well, Rasputin is alone with the Tsarina, right, and the royal palace. Um, and so by the late uh, World War I years, uh, a lot of unrest was mounting. Un un um, uh, inflation was up. Food shortages were up. The casualty rates were stacking up. And so... Because of the system of government that Russia had at the time, which is an absolute monarchy, uh, you know, the, the Tsar is the, the one all and be all end for everyone's problems, right? If they have issues, they come to the Tsar to fix them. And traditionally in the past, that has worked, right? The Tsar was the uh, richest and most powerful individual in the empire, and typically things would get done. But now they're just looking at him like to fix stuff, and he's not. And so, you know, all of these questions and theories were now circulating. Well, is he actually fit to rule? Right? Maybe he's not fit to rule. And plus, we have all of these kind of theories um, going, you know, throughout Europe at the time in the in intelligentsia and the universities that like we talked about, about possible revolution, about um, Marxism, right, and egalitarianism. But here he is on the front lines, um, you know, uh, you know, uh, speaking with uh, the uh, other various soldiers on the right hand side. He's speaking to his uh, much taller uh, uncle who was on the front lines on the Eastern Front. And so he is here to bolster up support and um, speak to his various, uh, you know, generals on the uh, type of battle tactics that they are having um, and the possible successes um, and being there as a symbolic uh, figure. So here he is with uh, a contingent of the uh, Russian uh, troops, and he is blessing them, right? He is giving a formal kind of religious blessing onto them before um, they ship off again, right, to battle. Um, but even though Tsar Nicholas II tried to uplift some of the, you know, morale, he was not doing enough, 
for reforms, for money, inflation, and all these other various things. And so revolution started to stir up in the form of the Bolsheviks. Um, the Bolsheviks, uh, in Bolshevik, the term literally means one of the majority, right? So you're kind of one of the collective, right? In a very kind of Marxist way. Um, you know, they eventually, the Bolsheviks became and turned into this kind of communistic party, right? Um, and so they were reading a ton of Marxist ideologies from, um, from Germany, from Karl Marx, uh, and, you know, proliferating these ideas of breaking down capitalism, of having more egalitarian solutions of government, um, distributing the means and resources of the state to the people themselves, right? So completely flipping this traditional capitalistic narrative on its head. A very, very revolutionary idea. Um, and so as m unrest is mounting, as people at the bottom are becoming more and more frustrated, right, at the situation and things are not getting done, the Bolsheviks are essentially saying, well, you know, the system is not working for you. So how about we destroy the system, turn it, oh, sorry, um, destroy the system, turn it upside down um, and, uh, you know, bring forth all of this extra manufacturing power um, and, you know, resources to, to you, the, the people. You are the hardworking individuals of Russia. And so if you are finding yourself at the bottom end of you know, let's say the socioeconomic totem, totem pole at this point in time, that is a very, uh, you know, wonderful idea for you to hear, right? And you, you would say, great, sure. And so they start to gain an immense amount of support. And the first large revolution out of the two in 1917 was the February Revolution. So this was the first of two. We would have the February one and we, ha we would have the October one. So the February Revolution... Um, were these massive demonstrations and armed clashes with police, right, right and kind of paramilitary forces. And so, um, you know, the Russian monarchy and the big cities were starting to see their support, um, you know, dwindle. There were around 180,000 troops within the capital. So the Tsar, feeling pretty confident that he has a huge army contingent, ordered the troops to suppress the riots by force, right? And to start shooting into the um, uh, crowds. Uh, but because there were so many women and uh, children in the crowd themselves, the soldiers began to mutiny. The soldiers began to say, no, we're not going to shoot into the crowds. Um, and so in March, we start having mutinous Russian forces side with the revolutionaries. And so a few days later, Tsar Nicholas II was forced to abdicate. Well, excuse me, he was not forced to abdicate. He was asked to abdicate by the Duma and a couple of the generals. Um, and so he still had the power, potentially, right, to bring all of this back together. But him, once again, being a softer, gentler soul, he just said, fine, I'll abdicate. Right? He never really wanted the throne. Um, and so this was the kind of official end of the Romanov dynasty, right? The Romanovs actually being in charge and ruling had officially ended here. And so a provisional government was set up. So hopefully the, this provisional government would be some type of better democratic system of government, right? Maybe potentially turn this into a constitutional monarchy or, you know, whatever. But, you know, they were trying to hold elections and they were trying to figure out what to do. But in the midst of all of this chaos, the Bolsheviks themselves saw an opportunity for power and they would end up grabbing it. And so as we're having all these various demonstrations right across the big cities, people are getting more and more disgruntled. Um, and we even have uh, the Cossacks and the army uh, soldiers right getting into the action here. Large demonstrations throughout the streets. And so this provisional government that Russia had established um, was pretty weak. Um, because the Tsar, the Tsar, uh, for the longest time had been right that uh, power, center of power for hundreds of years in Russia, and suddenly the Tsar had abdicated, and so obviously that is going to leave a power vacuum, right? So this provisional government was not as strong or as widely known to all the people across Russia and all the serfs and everyone else as the Tsar had been, and so the provisional government was very was very weak. The troops started to lose faith in the government and what they were doing. The bureaucracy started to falter. And so this weak government was now open to attack from both the left and the right. It ended up being more attacked by the left, the Bolsheviks, the communists, the one that wanted to 
uh, spread all of these egalitarian ideals right to the rest of the uh, you know empire and so the Bolsheviks started to truly gain steam um, they started to take control of parts of the uh, military they started to take control of the railroads and factories and so by the summer of 1917 soldiers and industrial workers started to stage armed protests throughout these large cities initially the Bolsheviks attempted to prevent some of these demonstrations but eventually as they saw these uh, demonstrations were actually in their favor. They decided to support them and then even lead them. And so by July of 1917, we have these large um, violent protests, right? Shootings and lootings and, you know, beatings, right? Kind of uh, spreading um, throughout the large cities, right? Absolute chaos, right? Is kind of uh, proliferating throughout some of the cities. Uh, some armed militias and protesters, right? Obviously, um, you know, trying to uh, make a point in these various cities um, and so the Bolsheviks themselves are trying to profit off of this chaos and so in comes Mr. Lenin right the very famous Vladimir Lenin he was a communist revolutionary right one of the Bolshevik heads um, and very astute politician and theorist and he was taking all of the ideals that he was uh, reading from uh, Karl Marx um, and turning them into his own philosophy and so essentially Marxism um, is the, you know, total global uh, deterioration of capitalism and arguing that capitalism innately puts people down, right? They are not kind to the working class. Um, and so, uh, you know, the resources of the nation uh, should be distributed more uh, egalitarianly and evenly across the people, right? Because the people form the governments, and so the governments have to answer to the people. Uh, and so Lenin took a lot of these philosophies and converted them into his own, where he wanted to support within Russia a one-party rule. He wanted the proletariat to dominate the, dominate the economy, the proletariats being the workers, right, the working class, um, opposing any bourgeoisie democracy, any kind of Western capitalistic democracy um, itself, and opposing capitalism itself. And so uh, Lenin himself, right, had so many wonderful quotes, but, you know, let's just read a couple of them here to see what his mindset was in relation to capitalism. Uh, when feudalism was overthrown and free capitalist society appeared in the world, it at once became apparent that this freedom meant a new system of oppression and exploitation of the working people. Clearly, he does not like capitalism because he believes that it is oppressing the capitalist um, society, right? And the workers at the bottom. His next quote. Monopolies, oligarchy, and striving for domination and not for freedom. The exploitation of an increasing number of small or weak nations by a handful of the richest or most powerful nations. All these have given birth to those distinctive characteristics of imperialism, which compel us to define it as parasitic or decaying capitalism. He does not like capitalism. He believes that it uh, breeds greed and monopolies and more power that will oppress the little guys. And so he's, you know, spe as you might imagine, as Russia is going through all of these political revolutions and the people are disgruntled, they're hungry, the wages are poor, the czar just abdicated, the government is weak. Lenin and his theories are very um, attractive at this point in time, right? Um, you know, capitalism has failed you. The czars and the, all of these oppressive powers have failed you and have been oppressing you for generations. Um, let us try something new. Let us try to, um, you know, have a more kind of free society here. And so the factory workers and everyone at the bottom absolutely ate it up. And so here we have Lenin, right, giving a speech on the right hand side, um, you know, rallying the workers, rallying the Bolshevik cause, right, as it were. And here we have the big three. On the left, we have Joseph Stalin, which we'll get into later. Uh, we have Lenin in the middle, and we have Trotsky on the right-hand side. I'll leave out Trotsky for a, for a bit. Um, I'll add some materials about him later, but Trotsky was more of the kind of idealist between the three. Um, Stalin was the most pragmatic. Lenin in the middle um, was the sort of in-between of idealistic and pragmatic and Trotsky in my opinion was the most idealistic so we'll we'll kind of discuss uh, Lenin and Stalin and their differences but Lenin on the left hand uh, Stalin on the, on the left hand side um, was the most practical individual and wanted to rule only Russia in a very practical way did not want to banter too many words he wanted action 
Len in the middle was between action and all of these philosophical ideas. Um, and so he wanted to build a better world at the heart of it. Um, but obviously his implementation uh, would not be successful. And then Trotsky on the right hand side uh, was more of the ideological theorist between the three. And so he wanted a worldwide revolution, not just in Russia. Um, and so we will see how these uh, different kind of paths and viewpoints are going to um, proliferate. And so the February Revolution happens. The July summer protests had undergone. And now we are in October, right, for the October Revolution. So by October, we started to see that the Bolshevik Party um, has finally um, enough support and enough armed support from the military that it can now march in and overthrow the government. And so now they are installing this Soviet um, style of government, right? Um, and they create the Soviet Red Guards, this paramilitary formation of you know, factory workers, peasants, Cossacks, soldiers, sailors, whoever they can get their hands on, they converted it into the, the Red Guard Army. Um, and so with these forces, they end up storming various governmental buildings and storming and capturing the Winter Palace that the Tsar and his family were living in at the time. And so uh, even though that new um, provisional government um, had technically not seen the Soviets win democratic power um, and not win out enough seats to actually be in power. The Soviets essentially just dissolved the parliament and said, the Soviets are in power now. We are installing our own Congress. Uh, too bad, so sad. You have to deal with it. And so we have the Soviet troops marching throughout uh, the cities, throughout the Red Square and taking over all of these governmental buildings, marching in a new reign of Soviet history. Um, and so here we have a little bit of a little bit of a spat of a civil war. Um, and in the previous World War One lecture, we saw that the United States had sent the polar bear expedition um, for a few thousand troops to help fight in this Russian civil war. And so it did, you know, happen over a couple of years, although not too successful on the um, on the white army side. But let's kind of just shortly talk about it and you know see what the main players were. And so once the civil war uh, you know, began, we start to see that the Red Army was facing off against the White Army. The Red Army was these new Soviet troops, right? The Union of Soviet Socialist Republics or USSR. Um, and so they were conscript, uh, conscripting people on large numbers. Uh, they were going to their families, their houses. Conscrip uh, conscription happened at gunpoint often, and they would take families hostage if you were not now loyal to the Soviet cause. So very early on through fear and intimidation, the Soviet and the Red Army started to bolster its numbers. And on the other uh, side, you had the White Army, a loose confederation of anti-communist forces um, you know, trying to fight the Reds. But this was a loose kind of mishmash of folks. It could be, you know, old military uh, officers and soldiers that were loyal to the Tsar. Um, it could be uh, folks that want a more democratic uh, world and society and want to see the parliament uh, restated and the Duma restated because they do not want this Red Army Soviet uh, military to, you know, reign free. And so the White Army was kind of a little more of a mishmash of different folks. Um, but some still thought maybe we can reinstate the Tsar, right? Um, and so from 1919 to 1923, we had various battles and skirmishes between both sides. But the Whites were slowly but surely uh, being beaten back by the Soviets and the Reds. Historians believe that the Whites were defeated pretty quickly because of their inability to connect themselves with the Tsarist regime. So if you went throughout Russia, almost everybody knew who the Tsar was. If you went throughout Russia and just said, fight for the White Army, they're going to be like, who? What? Um, and so I think they did not make that connection right close enough. And so allied nations, right, or like uh, nations in the uh, the West, right, were declaring the Soviets an abomination. Churchill had initially stated that Bolshevism must be strangled in its cradle. Um, and France, the U.S., Great Britain all attempted to help the Tsar and reinstate power in the region because not necessarily, you know, because they wanted to um, see Russia gain strength, but because of Lenin's and the Soviets' ideology, 
because all of these governments are you know operating in a kind of capitalistic society right as usual but Lenin and the Soviets are completely changing the conversation around right trying to dismantle capitalism at its very core so this is within an ideological perspective a truly radical um, invention right in the world and so they did not want for this to spread eventually of course the ideas did spread and after this we see China turned into communist uh, uh, turned towards communism uh, Vietnam other nations around the world Cuba right it, it really did end up spreading and so that was the main fear of these allies moving forward and so the white army here right uh, some of the officers uh, trying to uh, you know hold some type of meetings together but in the end not being too successful and so over time uh, we have all the various uh, uh, fightings um, here a mishmash of photographs uh, the red army over here is hanging all of their political enemies and rivals and some of the white army troops uh, we see the red soldiers marching on for victory here we have trotsky himself trying to rally the troops and say that this is a now a global revolution for uh communism right excuse me not communism for uh this new kind of leninism right that they are proposing oh and here on the uh, right hand side we have French soldiers, so we have a contingent of those outside forces. The Americans for the polar bear expedition, we have some French forces um, here. So some of the foreign powers are trying to help these uh, whites win the Civil War, but it would not be enough because the Romanovs would now be assassinated and put to death. Um, and so the, uh, the Reds, uh, the Soviets ended up rounding up the, uh, you know, Tsar Nicholas II and his entire family, his wife and his daughters, um, putting them in a uh, you know, small damp room um, in this kind of small cottage and shooting them all to death. Um, and so this was officially the end of the Russian uh, Empire, the death of the Romanovs, um, and sort of the nail in the coffin for any potential conversation of the Tsar regime coming back into fruition, right? Because it was it was not going to happen anymore. They're, they're, you know, he was assassinated. Um, not assassinated, excuse me, executed. It's two different things. Oh, and so if you have time, please watch a couple of these videos. They are great. I'm kind of detailing some of the death of the Romanovs. And so sadly, uh, Tsar Nicholas II, his wife, um, their four girls, and his son and heir, um, Alexei, they were all um, put to death. Um, so if only he had a stronger measured hand with the revolutionaries, um, he could have potentially averted all of this. Uh, remember I said that uh, Tsar Nicholas II looked eerily similar to King George V of England? That's them on the left-hand side. They truly look like twins, don't they? Although they are cousins, the similarity is just uncanny. Um, but, of course, you know, Lenin on the right-hand side, um, it goes completely against, uh, you know, the kind of cap uh, capitalistic sense of government. Um, and truly kind of, you know, old school and new school here, right? These two ideologies are clashing and rivaling. Um, and so we're going to see in our Cold War lectures just what that meant um, and how it was going to come into play. But, you know, very early on, the, uh, the other nations of the world do not look favorably onto this communistic uh, and uh, Marxist revolution. Um, so the you know political cartoon here on the left hand side saw that Russia is now being taken out of World War One, and then Lenin and Trotsky in the background as two reptilian kind of creatures, right? Uh, they are not seen in the best light, and then eventually down the road, the United States would go through an immense campaign against communists and against the Reds and the Russians coming in and you know potentially um, killing off the American men, you know, um, and destroying society as they know it. enter stalin so we just had the highlight and the you know heyday of lenin right and his theories and him leading the february revolution the october revolution and finally the bolsheviks and now the soviets are in power who the heck was joseph stalin and why did he become the number one honcho 
So he was part of this Bolshevik uh, party. He was Georgian by birth, um, finished uh, his schoolings, but uh, eventually found himself getting into a bunch of trouble and finding his way into the Bolshevik secret meetings and turning into this kind of Bolshevik radical, right? And so many of these younger folks were becoming radicalized at the schools and the universities, and that's where he found a lot of his niche as well. And so he held Lenin in very deep respect because they were vocalizing some similar theories, but uh, he was disagreeing with Lenin on some other issues because uh, Lenin wanted to focus more on kind of reforming the uh, elections in the Duma. Stalin thought the entire parliamentary system was a waste of time. He wanted action, not words. So very early on, he wanted a more, you know, uh, military rule with the fist. And so he spent a lot of his uh, years in and out of prison, went into exile for a little bit, and he was acknowledged by the Tsarist secret police um, and was making a name for himself in the party. So the fact that the Tsar's secret police for years knew about Lenin and Stalin and the Bolsheviks, they did nothing. Technically, the Tsar could have, because he was getting reports of these individuals, um, technically he could have just ordered for all of them to be rounded up and assassinated, right, as enemies of the state. But um, he did not work uh, quickly enough for that. And so uh, from 1922 to 24, we have the formation of the Soviet Union. Once Lenin was victorious, Stalin started to work his own position within the Bolshevik party to raise his standard and position and influence. Uh, and at the same time, Lenin was unfortunately having health issues. He was prone to strokes. After his third stroke, um, he became incredibly weak and he just could not lead the party anymore. And so he was writing to the party asking for them to remove Stalin from power because he started to see where all of this was headed. And he started to see that Stalin was becoming more and more power hungry. Um, and so he wanted for, the, for it to end. But Stalin, in a pre, uh, preemptive move, put him on house arrest saying that, well, my friend, you have to rest. You're sick. You just had a stroke. Kept him on house arrest until his death. And so he could not go out there and muster any support against Stalin. And so especially after his death, Stalin, uh, the man who had been in and out of prison, he had been part of all of these revolutions and followed by the secret police. And, you know, he climbed his way up uh, the totem pole of the Bolshevik party. Uh, he ended up, uh, you know, becoming um, more of equals to uh, Lenin and having respect in the party. And eventually after Lenin's stroke, uh, he ends up becoming the leader of the party and really kind of shapes it himself. Here is a kind of painting uh, depicting what maybe some of their final moments would have looked like right on the bed. Uh, most likely Stalin here uh, viewing Lenin, the man who had uh, started all of these revolutions through his wise words and rhetoric and his intelligence. And Stalin is now going to be standing on the shoulders of his accomplishments. And Lenin here... Uh, laying and looking at the man who he pretty much can see is going to lead Russia through a bloody campaign of brutal repression and perhaps the revolution that they had um, so you know long fought for right for the people to be liberated from the oppressors of capitalism are, are now going to replace the repressors of capitalism with the repressor of Stalin and so I can't imagine what some of the final moments would have looked like between the two men but um, I would imagine that Lenin, being the great intellect that he was, um, probably saw the failure of, you know, not stemming uh, Stalin's hunger and thirst for power enough. So once Stalin gets into power, he starts to do what, you know, he starts to do. Um, you know, he first uh, initiates what is called the five year plan. For whatever reason, all these communistic and you know Soviet-style uh, regimes, they love their five-year plans. Uh, China would implement this as well. But essentially, this is a very concerted effort to say, look, for the next few years, we are going to increase our productivity and we're going to do this and that. Um, and so, you know, he wanted to edit out this plan and essentially rework the farming systems um, throughout all of the you know surf land. Um, to, you know, make it a little more uh, state-owned and standardized, right? And so his five-year plans were, uh, you know, they were definitely forcing Russia into more of an industrial age. Uh, 
but at, at very high cost because it came hand in hand with what was called the Great Purge. Um, Stalin started to make large scale uh, executions, killings, uh, kidnappings and repressing of peasants, government officials, Red Army leaderships. Anybody he suspected of being a traitor was either put in prison, sent to a gulag in the north to work, um, or executed. He started becoming consumed with fear, right, and needed to retain his control. He exiled all of his political rivals, including Trotsky. Remember the famous Trotsky, one of those like top three guys we were talking about? Exiled him. Um, and other exiles uh, were going towards uh, Siberia, right, to work in a gulag. A gulag is essentially a forced labor camp um, where you are, um, you know, just forced to break rocks all day long and just work until you die, right? And so the argument here is, well, if they're going to be dead anyways, let's at least have them work and have some labor, right, to benefit the state before they end up dying. And so just from a one, one year period, the Soviet KGB archives tell us that from 1937 to 1938, more than 1.5 million people were arrested and more than 680,000 were shot immediately and executed. Um, over the 1930s in general, the deaths ranged from the 10 plus million range, right? And Stalin was just so brutal. Um, even... Trotsky, who he exiled from Russia, uh, Trotsky ended up finding a home in Mexico of all places. And but within Mexico, Trotsky, being the very kind of eloquent intellectual that he was, started to write vicious, scathing things about Stalin and his repressive regime. Um, <laughs> and I can't make this up. Trotsky was later assassinated with an ice pick. Think of that, the symbolism. He was assassinated in Mexico with an ice pick. Uh, and so many speculate that it was Stalin that hired the assassins and forced the assassination. But, you know, history um, has many secrets. And so the ironic, you know, tragedy is that although Stalin has now made himself like on the left hand side, a poster child for being a man of the people a man of the children, this beautiful angelic figure to lead the people into a better world. Um, in reality, uh, many were sent into these repressive gulags that we see on the right-hand side, literally just breaking apart rock all day long or whatever laborious tasks they had made for them in order to exhaust them, uh, feeding them absolute gruel. Um, you know, many were hungry, starving, uh, in bad shape, but, you know, these are essentially, you know, very slow death camps. Um, and so you'd be working all day long, uh, you know, barely have anything great to eat. Um, and, you know, you did not have any, you know, wonderful possessions to your name. These are two wonderful videos that I saw um, called the Gulag Experiences. Um, and so the one the video on the left hand side is this very heart wrenching story of a, um, of, you know, this lady who survived the Gulags. Um, and she discusses her parents being taken away with that black KGB car. Uh, she eventually, at eight months pregnant, is taken away. Details all of her experiences there. Um, it's truly, it gives you a sort of an insight into Stalin's regime and the KGB that ended up ensuing because of that. And the story on the right-hand side, the video on the right-hand side, is of this World War II veteran who met somebody who survived the gulags right he met a russian from the the gulags and when asking him interestingly how his experiences were he said oh not too bad and he's like what are you talking about it's the gulags you know how did you survive and so essentially the guy said that yes things were terrible but we were all in this terrible mess together and so we somehow survived. And so through family and this new community that they were forming in the gulags, like we got through it, right? We collectively struggled. An interesting kind of viewpoint and story on that. Definitely worth your time. Here's a little bit more of a kind of traditional video on the rise of Stalin in the Soviet Union. It's not too long. I think it's uh, below 10 minutes. But kind of details some of the, uh, the main beats of let's say the rise of Stalin um, through the Soviet Union um, and you know his dealings with Lenin, the revolutions and everything else. Truly a monumental 
a moment in right history for sure. And for those of you who want a quick like 15 minute recap from our general uh, historian John Green, uh, he'll give you a Russian Revolution and Civil War uh, crash course um, if you want to um, kind of have that as a wrap up. And so that is going to be the end of the um, the lecture. Um, this, you know, Russian Revolution uh, time period is very uh, influential, not just in Russian history or European history, um, but in world history, because from this, that quintessential idea of communism is going to spread. They turned whatever the Karl Marx original ideas were, they co converted that into some type of Leninist ideology, right, of working within the state and changing things. And eventually Stalin is going to take that and convert it into communism his own version of Leninism, but ruling with an iron fist where he is the top, um, you know, uh, the top person of the uh, nation. Um, and so communism would end up spreading throughout the 20th century, almost like wildfire throughout the world, leading us into um, conversations of World War Two and conversations of the Cold War, right, coming forward. So uh, definitely worth a watch. Um, thank you so much for being here for the Russian Revolution section. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope it was fun. Um, and I will see you for the next uh, lecture. Take care, folks.